start. Um, I could just as easily have called this, um, this talk, uh, Will the Real Netanyahu Step Forward? Um, because, you know, uh, he comes across as a man who is very sort of tough, uh, rigid, a uh, man who sort of, you know, is unbending in terms of what uh, he considers, considers to be um, the uh, interests of Israel, and that's, that's, and, that's, and that's fine. But while it's important, obviously, to understand where Netanyahu is come, coming from, it's also important to understand what Israelis want, uh, because, of course, we know that... Um, uh, you know, it's not easy to discern what the electorate might concede, might want to do at any given time uh, in, uh, in, in, in the outcome of negotiations. No political survivor like Netanyahu is as political, politically rigid as he pretends, and no electorate is ever of a single mind. This is particularly true in Israel, where none of the 12 political parties in the last election, 2009, got more than 22.5% of the vote. Um, the uh, Kadima, in fact, got the 22.5%. Kadima got 21.6%. But the leader of Likud uh, is the prime minister with um, 27 seats out of 120. So you can see there are, uh, uh, as I say, 12 political parties. Six of them got something like six sorry, 3% or less in the election. So you can see how f fractured um, the pol politics is. The Labour Party, which used to be a very significant party in Israeli pol pol politics, managed to um, uh, reduce itself to 9.9%. Um, it's there or thereabouts at the moment. Uh, it declined in recent polls, well, up to about a year ago, anyhow, to around 6%. It's beginning to climb again. It has elected a new uh, lead, lead leader. It lost its old one. Uh, he left and formed a new party in the last um, few, few months. So we have to try and make a judgment about what it is uh, Netanyahu, Netanyahu wants, and indeed what uh, he's likely to concede. We have to try and, uh, as I say, un untangle the puzzle. I say puzzle because not for the first time, in my view, he has missed an opportunity to win friends. I would have thought that if he wanted to go into negotiations this time, he would have won the heart of the world had he said yes to a UN seat for the state of Palestine. He would have made it particularly difficult for Abbas to refuse such an offer. He would also have helped his ally, President Obama, in his re-election efforts. Uh, and the US, he would have also enhanced, which would have enabled Obama to enhance the, the status of the United States in, uh, in the region. He would have changed the mood in Europe towards Israel uh, and the Arab world. Uh, and it would have cost Israel nothing. Not nothing. I mean, what exactly would it cost Israel to say yes to a UN seat for the state of Palestine? Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it simply seems to me that it would have been a win-win all round, as the cliché says. Indeed, I, I would argue that it's not too late uh, for uh, him to switch tack. Uh, and he would still make considerable gains, uh, in my view both polit politically, domestically, and internationally. No doubt he would probably lose his foreign minister, Mr. Lieberman. Uh, um, that might or might not precipitate an election. Um, on the other hand, uh, Kadima uh, has said that they are willing to support uh, Dan Netanyahu in negotiations in finding a way through uh, into, into negotiations. Even if it did precipitate a general election, of course, Netanyahu would have a very strong card in terms of presenting himself as an international statesman who has taken a bold step to, uh, to open up the whole area of negotiations and to uh, find a way forward. So he would have a very strong card in my view. So why uh, has he not taken this line? Why has he, in the course, in, by, by taking his position, almost 
obliged the United States to take a similar p position, which has not been good for Obama and not been good for the United States uh, in the region. I think we have to consider that, that take this into account, that, that Mr. Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, is the leader of the Likud party. He has constructed a governing majority um, whose task it is obviously to deliver peace and security and prosperity. Um, how he does that is driven in the first instance by his own politics and sec sec secondly by his coalition partners, I've already mentioned one, 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 one of them, that he has chosen to go into go government with. And there is no doubt that most of his partners harden his position rather than act as a moderating force. The constitution of the Likud party, which is on the web, it can be found at, uh, um, I think it's netanyahu.org.israel, um, says in Article 2, the Likud is a national liberal party, a bit like the PDs, if you like, uh, which advocates the ingathering of the exiles, the, the integrity of the Jewish homeland, human freedom and social justice, and it strives to achieve these goals by a bringing together the Jewish people in the land of Israel, in gathering its dispersed people, cultivating love of the country in the hearts of the people, and recognizing the shared destiny of all of the Jewish people, and b safeguarding the right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel as an eternal inalienable right, working diligently to settle and develop all parts of the land of Israel and extending national sovereignty to them. I should add, of course, that it also commits its members to in maintaining a democratic form of government, guaranteeing the supremacy of law, human and civil rights, freedom of conscience, individual freedoms, equal rights and opportunities of all citizens of the state, and providing discrimination on the grounds of gender, race, ethnic origin, religion, status or viewpoint. And that's not the totality of their constitution, obviously, but I think these are key elements for the point of, from the point of view of our discussion here today. The land of Israel is not defined in the constitution, in the party constitution, nor is it defined in Israel's basic laws. It is understood to mean the biblical land of Israel. In other words, it means Palestine as a whole, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, and even further for the more zealous. It also includes Jerusalem as a whole of the, uh, as the Israeli capital. This goes way beyond the territory allocated to the Jewish state, and I, I mention that fact because Jewish state is specifically mentioned in uh, Resolution 181 of 1947, um, because there's a lot of debate, and we can talk about that, about whether or not Israel should be recognized as a Jewish state or not. Um, but as I say, it um, goes way, way beyond the territory allocated to the Jewish state in the UN Resolution of 47. In other words, it includes the land allocated to the Arab state, which is referred to in the, in the UN Resolution. And it's worth noting here that the resolution also provided for international management of a united Jerusalem for a period of 10 years to be reviewed after that. And interestingly, an economic union between the two states. Uh, which we, we never hear about, which I think is quite interesting, that in 1947 there was this proposal. In short, the Likud party, and presumably its leader, is committed to a one-state solution. But this helps explain a number of things about Netanyahu. His ongoing justification for the settlement or colony building in East Jerusalem and the West Bank, his claim that Israel will have to make painful compromises to allow an independent Palestinian state to emerge, his claim that settlers, with his, which his predecessor, um, Mr. Olmert, removed from Gaza, were actually living in Israel, his denial that the IDF is occupying the West Bank, and the annexation of East Jerusalem, of course, justification of that as part of Israeli ter ter territory. And I think his speech, if you read his speech in the UN last week, I think it more or less confirms that, that view, that world view that he, that, that he has. Now, I'm not claiming that one's party constitution or even one's national constitution precludes the negotiated compromises on the boundaries of a national ter ter territory. The Irish constitutional claim on the ter ter territory of Northern Ireland which incidentally also ignored the worrisome reality of the presence of a very large indigenous population who didn't agree, uh, was amended as part of a package of com com compromises which brought about um, the peace um, uh, that we now know. Uh, and I am not aware of any party in the Republic of, or in Northern Ireland that has changed their constitutional aspirations with regard to United Ireland, <clears throat> or indeed the United Kingdom for that matter. Any member of Sinn Féin 
uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, they have not abandoned their aspiration to unite Ireland, nor am I aware that, any, that the IRA in any of its manifestations, manifestations have ever done so. The key to a compromise for an end to a conflict over, of, over territorial rights is a commitment to maintaining a negotiated compromise which has been approved by the people affected and that any future change will be pursued by force of argument rather than force of arms. In the Middle East, the conflict is primarily around the issue of which nation, the Israeli Jewish nation or the Palestinian Arab nation, has a right to the historic territory of Palestine. Many Israelis regard it as theirs, while many Palestinians regard it as theirs. Each produces evidence, religious, historical and archaeological, to sustain their claim. In other words, there is a clash of rights. An ideal solution in an ideal world would be for both nations to live in a single binational state or even federal state. But for historical and religious reasons, very few believe that would work. As a result, for many years, and 40 years after the 1947 uh, partition, the PLO in 1988 made the historic offer to accept a Palestinian state on the territory they were left with after the war in 48. Their border with Israel and Israel's border with them would be the pre-67 line, that is the 1949 armistice line, which was, of course, breached by Israel's occupation following the 67 war. This would leave the Palestinians with the West Bank and East Jerusalem and Gaza. This, I think, is an extraordinary offer to Israel. It accepts that a Palestinian state would exist on only 22% of what they regard as their historic homeland, while conceding that Israel would have a legitimate right to 78% of what they regard as their entitlement. Put another way, Israel concedes 22%, while the Palestinians concede 78%. But Prime Minister Netanyahu and most of his coalition partners clearly want more. This is evidenced by his decision to continue the relentless building of homes for Israeli settlers in the West Bank and in Palestinian East Jerusalem, and also to provide subsidies for settlers there, providing Israeli-only roads, linking them back into Israel, despite the social problems in Israel itself, which came to the fore this summer, and the obvious difficulties it creates for the resumption of negotiations. A refusal to stop in the face of repeated pleas by the European Union and by the USA reinforces the view that there is a desire, at the very least, to entrench control of as much Palestinian territory as possible before the inevitable compromises have to be made if negotiations resume. The Netanyahu demand that Israel must have the right to continue to occupy the Jordan Valley on security grounds would squeeze even further the territory of the Palestinian state. The Jordan Valley is already a militarised zone controlled by the IDF, which applies military law under which they deny local Palestinians permits to build homes, schools and places of worship in that area on security grounds. And when they go ahead and build anyway without permits, they are then demolished. And I've seen this with my own eyes. Despite all this, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu says that he favours a viable two-state solution. Not, mind you, a two viable states solution. And I think there is a, a key distinction there. Uh, because, of course, you know, uh, uh, you know, viable two states can, can mean, mean leaves the, the, the question of you know, what, what is the, the nature of, of, of the two states and the extent of the two, 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 two states. Taking the conditions he is creating on the ground as a reflection of his real intentions, his definition of what would constitute a Palestinian state would be nothing more than a series of Palestinian reservations or Bantustans separated from each other by Israeli-only roads servicing the settlements, some of which are small cities. Uh, with Palestinians dependent, with Palestine dependent on Israeli Israel for water and energy supplies, and with no economic independence. And I think you, you, you can already, if you look at maps of which shows um, the UNRWA, the United Nations uh, Refugee Agency, um, uh, and indeed uh, the uh, various other uh, people produce maps, but there are official maps which show the location of settlements and the location of roads and the, the way in which the West Bank is divided in, into sec, sec, sectors as a result. And it's very clear that you will have po po pockets of ter ter territory which a Palestinian state will control, 
but there will be no uh, contiguous state. And bearing in mind that the U e European U Union's call is for a de democratic, viable, contiguous state, uh, it, 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 it's important that this issue, issue also uh, is addressed in terms of the settlement. So it's not just a question of negotiations. Stopping the uh, uh, halt to the settlements for now pen, pen, pending the outcome of negotiations, but it's clear that something has to be done with set settlements that are already there, um, at least those that are deep inside the uh, West, West Bank, if we're going to achieve a uh, contiguous state uh, and indeed avoid the kind of clashes that, um, uh, that would uh, uh, be, be inevitable if uh, things remain as they are. Um, then the question is, what does what Netanyahu want reflect what Israeli society wants? The answer, as always, is yes and no. It's politics. One can assume that a majority of Israelis agreed with Netanyahu at the time of his election in 2009, otherwise they would not give him and his coalition partners a majority. However, electoral results don't necessarily reflect people's views on what concessions should be made in peace negotiations. As we know from our own experience in Ireland, people are prepared to make very significant compromises for peace. I often relate to my colleagues in the European Parliament my own experience in the Dáil on the question of Article 2 and 3 of the Irish Constitution. I recall provide, proposing a private member's bill in the Dáil to reform those articles from a territorial claim uh, to a desire for a united Ireland by consent. My proposal was heavily defeated by the other political parties in the Dáil at that time. Yet six years later, when that very reform was included in a broad package of compromises by all sides to the conflict, the people of this republic voted overwhelmingly for it in a referendum. But how can we judge what the electorate in Israel and Palestine would support in a possible referendum on a settlement? One of the tools in modern peace negotiations is the use of what are called peace polls. Uh, there's a <clears throat> Dr. Colin Irwin, who I invited over to, to Ireland uh, about a year ago uh, to talk to us about this issue. Uh, he's um, uh, lectures in the Institute of Irish Studies in Liverpool University, and he's been commissioned to conduct peace polling on conflicts around the world for many years, including Macedonia, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Cyprus and Kashmir and indeed Northern Ireland where his services were used. I think he carried out something like nine polls in the course of the uh, negotiations where the effort was to identify in terms of what was being discussed by the par um, parties uh, what, what kind of reaction uh, did, did these various ideas have among, amongst the electorate. The idea was to try and ba see what would be acceptable, but also not so much, you know, what would be sort of completely acceptable, but what level of objection was there? Because equally, the, the level of objections to a particular proposal is just as important. Because if you have 50% saying no or 40% saying no, then you've got a serious problem. If you've got 10% saying no or 20% saying no, you can uh, balance, uh, bal 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 balance them. Um, in 2008, he was commissioned by the One Voice organization, which is an NGO which works both in Palestine and Israel, um, um, which seeks to find common understanding between Palestinians and Israelis about the future, about their life, and about living together. But they, and they commissioned him to do a poll on the Middle East conflict. The idea was to identify what people on each side might accept, and just as importantly, reject which helps clearly negotiators to judge what might be acceptable to one's own supporters, because of course you know you have different parties in the in in the negotiations and <clears throat> taking the Northern Ireland example, you know, the, what would be acceptable to the UUP might not be acceptable to the DUP or the PUP, and uh, what might be acceptable to Sinn Féin would not be acceptable to the SDLP, and so on and so on. And then, like likewise, what's uh, as in this in this case, what was acceptable in the Republic, because of course we had a, a critical in interest in bringing the whole thing uh, to an end. Um, Dr. Colin Irwin has a warning, however, about polling. He warns about the damage that can be done to peace processes by partisan polling 
for either from an Israeli or a Palestinian perspective. In other words, attempts to sort of mobilise pub public support uh, behind a particularly negative position, for instance, um, in the course of negotiations, which uh, can actually block negotiations. The role of the Peace Bowl is to try and find agreement, not to find um, uh, you know, where, where, where agreement lies, rather than uh, trying to find uh, or create uh, uh, obstacles. He published his Peace Bowl in April 2009, not long after the current Israeli Knesset was elected. His findings make a fascinating reading, and I'm not going to go into them in detail because it's a very long, uh, very, very long report, and, but it's worth looking at. It's worth re re reading for anybody who's, who's interested in seeing what the, 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 you know, the, the, how P -P 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 people's views cross over. But as, as I said, they make fascinating uh, re reading. But are, in my view, a basis for hope that the conflict can, in fact, be brought to an end with a sustainable peace based on the 67 borders with land swaps, shared capital for Jerusalem, uh, and a, um, a, a, a solution to the problem of refugees. The poll found that over 70% of Israelis and Palestinians want a negotiated peace. It found that over 70% of Palestinians and Israelis want or will accept a two-state solution, while there is only marginal support on either side for either from the Palestinian side, historic Palestine state, um, i.e. the historic home, homeland, um, and there's only marital support on the Israeli side for the same idea, for his, sort of, uh, the idea of uh, Israel uh, as a to totality from the Mediterranean to the, and to the Jordan. So I, I think that's an important one. And the other result is um, that is encouraging it was the suggestion that Israel should freeze settlements as a first step to deal with the set of settlements. Only 23% of Israelis found that unacceptable. Um, similarly, only 23% of Palestinians were opposed to the proposal to stop firing rockets from Gaza. In other words, um, 70, what is it, 77 percent of Palestinians want uh, firing from of rockets attacking Israelis, whether they're civilians or they have to stop, which I think is a very hopeful sign. Uh, after th her 30 years of the troubles um, and failed negotiations in Northern Ireland, of course, the governments of Britain and Ireland and the US moved to internationalise that process, and they made the people and civil society active partners and stakeholders. And that is precisely what President Abbas has tried to do in the last two weeks. His strategy has pushed the conflict to the top of the international agenda, with the USA unable at this time to lead as a neutral. The European Union, I think, can offer leader leadership. Cathy Ashton has built a reputation in the region as a fair-minded and tireless high representative on behalf of the EU. The member states must now, I think, unanimously back her in her efforts in the quartet and indeed outside the quartet. Um, to persuade both sides to get around the table. There is a window of opportunity now which won't stay open forever. I think finally, going back to the Irwin uh, uh, poll, it's worth no noting that 73% of pa Palestinians and 52% of Israelis were opposed to the idea that the PLO and Fatah and Israel should negotiate in secret. Uh, they're of the view that that has failed in the past and they want to be kept informed. They say they would prefer if that progress in negotiations, they would like to see targets set, they would like to see timetables set, and they would like to see milestones sort of identified in terms of making uh, progress. So I think bearing in mind that this was a poll which was published in 2009, around the same time as the current Knesset was elected, and of course, you know, as I say, a week is a long time in politics, but it seems to me that it indicates on the underlying uh, ideas on both the Palestinian side and on the uh, uh, Israeli side amongst the people is that they want peace, they want it negotiated, they have a fair idea of what they're likely to accept, what, they would, what they're willing to accept in terms of uh, a, a, an agreement which will en enable Palestinians to live a, a decent life and they would live in peace and security as well. So. Um, I, I, say, I think there's hope there, I think despite the fact that at the moment things look a bit bleak in terms of negotiations, about being blocked and so on, um, 
but if uh, obviously you, you may have different ideas and I'd be happy to hear them and I'd be happy to discuss them um, and if, if there are any questions you'd like to, me, like to ask me. I should conclude by saying the European Parliament yesterday uh, approved a resolution, uh, a cross-party res resolution by a large majority supporting the idea of a UN seat for the Palestinian state in the United Nations. Uh, I think that's a lead which the mem member state uh, perhaps might, uh, might follow. Thank you very much.